Good afternoon if you're in the Eastern Time Zone. Welcome to Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds for September 11, 2019. My name is Antonio Neri from the Preventive Medicine Residency and Fellowship, and we're also joined by HRSA and SAMHSA representatives. We're going to do introductions, so I'll pass it over to our next. Um, again, my name is Antonio Neri. Uh, I'm the director of the Preventive Medicine Residency and Fellowship here at CDC, and we welcome you to our Grand Round Special Session. A couple of things to note is that if we will pose questions in um, the chat box on the bottom of your screen, there's a question and answer box. You can pose questions to the speakers at any time, and they will receive them and uh, respond to them as they see fit during their presentation. There is continuing education associated with this course, and you can go to find that on the website, cdc.gov slash prevmed, and the course code to access this course will be CDCPMRS, all capitals, CDCPMRS. This is the second in a two-course series. You can also find a link to the prior eating disorders webinar on our website at that website noted before. With that, I'll pass it off to Dr. Irene Sandvold, who will introduce the Bureau of Health Workforce. Thank you. I can't hear you. Okay. I am Irene Sambold, Special Assistant in Bureau of Health Workforces Division of Medicine and Dentistry. And I'm honored to welcome you to this web webinar on behalf of BHW and DMD. We encourage you as participants to actively participate in the question and answer section of the agenda and to take advantage of the continuing education opportunity. We hope that you are able to use this information in your educational programs and in providing primary care. Please let us know if there are other aspects of this subject that would be helpful to you. Thank you also to our co-sponsors, our partners, CDC, versus Office of Women's Health, and SAMHSA, through their cooperative agreement with the University of North Carolina. I am now transitioning this session to Dr. Sabrina matoff Staff, Director of the HRSA Office of Women's Health, to introduce our presenter. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, again, my name is Dr. Sabrina madoff Step, and I'm the Director of the Health Resources and Services Administration Office of Women's Health. And we are very pleased this afternoon to be partnering with HRSA's Bureau of Health Workforce, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and their grantee, the National Center of Excellence in Eating Disorders. So we are thrilled to be part of this webinar. As you've heard, this is the second webinar in a series. Um, we are very lucky to have Dr. Christine Peet and Dr. Martha Perry with us this afternoon to talk about a very important topic. Um, this is around primary care management of eating disorders. And I wanted to share a little bit more about each of them before we get started. First of all, Dr. Pete is the director of the National Center for Excellence in Eating Disorders and an assistant professor of psychiatry at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She's completed her undergraduate degree in psychology at the University of Arizona and earned her master's degree and doctorate in clinical psychology at the University of North Dakota. Um, her program area of research is around innovative psychological treatments for eating disorders. 
treatment dissemination, and examining comorbidities between eating and weight pathology and medical morbidity. Thank you very much for joining, Dr. P. And we're also joined by Dr. Martha Perry. She's the medical director of the UNC Children's Primary Care Clinic. She has her medical degree from the University of Massachusetts and completed her residency in pediatrics at Boston Medical Center and Boston Children's Hospital. She completed her fellowship in adolescent medicine at the University of California, San Francisco and Boston Children's Hospital. She provides medical care to adolescents with complex health needs, including menstrual disorders, contraceptive management, gender affirming care, eating disorders, and medication management of a number of different health issues. So please um, join us for this webinar, um, ask your questions, um, and we're very excited to have you um, this afternoon. So at this chance, I'm going to turn the webinar over to Pete. Thanks so much, everyone, for the great introductions, and thank you all for being here this afternoon. Um, Dr. Perry and I are thrilled to be able to be presenting this information to what we're hoping will be a pretty diverse audience with um, representation from lots of different fields. And really, the idea is that we'd like to be able to give some information on best practices for um, identifying eating disorders, preventing their progression, but really with a particular lens on the role of primary care. So. Um, um, with that said, what I'd like to do uh, before we really launch into the information is to get a sense for who all might be on the call. So Lillian, if I could have you pull up the first polling question, that would be great. Okay, so for those of you that are here um, in the audience with us, if you could indicate which setting it is in which you practice. So you'll see a variety of different options there. Um, if other is sort of the best fit, please go ahead and choose that. But we're just trying to get a sense of where it is that everyone tends to practice um, that's here on the call. And we'll give everyone another few seconds or so to go ahead and respond before we move on. Looks like we have a lot of folks who are representative of mental or behavioral health. Also a good number of you that are in primary care, which is great. All right, so we'll go ahead and close out this first poll, but it looks like we've got a fair representation of mental and behavioral health as well as primary care. Um, and then Lillian, if you would pull up the second polling question, that would be great. And again, this is just to give us some more information about who might be joining us today. This next question is about your clinical background, so this will help give us a sense of um, what types of disciplines might be represented in addition to the types of um, places where you practice. All right, so we're seeing some representation here of folks with social work in their background in addition to physicians, nurses. Got a good group of folks who are here with PhDs, dietitians as well, which is great. I'll give everyone another second or so to go ahead and respond before we move on to uh, really the bulk of our presentation for this afternoon. Okay, great. Lillian, if you would go ahead and close out that poll. Thanks, everyone, for all that information. This is just really helpful for Martha and me as we're thinking through, you know, who might be on the call this afternoon and how we can try and tailor some of this information. So before we kind of launch into the bulk of what we're going to be discussing for this afternoon, I wanted to give a brief overview of NSEED, or the National Center of Excellence for Eating Disorders. Um, for those of you that were in attendance on the first webinar, some of this will be review, but knowing that some of you didn't have a chance to attend the first one, we wanted to make everyone aware that NSEED is the nation's first center of excellence dedicated to eating disorders. So last year, SAMHSA awarded a grant to establish NSEED and our primary mission is really focused on providing evidence-based education and training on the management of eating disorders. And we're marketing this to two broad groups. 
So one are to healthcare professionals, like those of you that are here today, but also to the general public and helping them improve their eating disorder literacy. So if you go to our website, which is hyperlinked here at the bottom, you can sign up for additional updates on what we're up to, um, the trainings and the different um, educational courses that we'll be offering. So we encourage everyone to go to the website, take a look, and just know that there's more to come down the road. In terms of an overview for this afternoon, there's going to be three broad goals that we're going to try and cover. So the first is to describe the medical assessment of really common eating disorders and how there might be some barriers to detecting these in a primary care setting. We'll also talk in depth about examining the level of care guidelines that exist for determining what type of care or what level of care patients with eating disorders might require. And then we'll talk broadly about best practices for how you might collaborate with an eating disorder specialty team. So depending on your role, um, what kind of information might you be contributing? How might you be interfacing with those other members of the team? So first, I'd like to talk broadly about um, the common eating disorders. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but the common eating disorders and how they may be detected um, in various practices. So uh, just as a kind of high-level review from the first webinar, and for you know, some of this may be um, also information that you're already familiar with, but I wanted to go over a few of the um, highlights in terms of diagnoses. So first, anorexia nervosa. Anorexia nervosa is a diagnosis that is really defined by this intense fear of gaining weight, or what some might call a fear of fatness such that somebody is restricting significantly the amount of caloric intake that they're um, taking in on a, on a regular basis. There's a lot of detail and nuance that goes into a full threshold diagnosis. However, broadly speaking, we're talking about two different subtypes. There's one in which individuals are purely restricting their intake. And then there is a subtype in which individuals are also engaging in binge purge cycles. Um, with the new iteration of the DSM-5, there are also severity ratings based purely on BMI. Um, and we can certainly have a lively discussion about the limitations of that particular approach. But for now, the BMI is really ranked depending on how low your BMI is, according to what you can see here on the screen. Before going into the next couple of diagnoses, I want to unpack what we mean by a binge eating episode because the next several eating disorder diagnoses are really centered around binge eating pathology. So I think it's important that we have a shared definition of what we mean when we talk about that. So for our purposes, a binge eating episode is really defined as eating an unusually large amount of food in a prescribed period of time while experiencing a sense of loss of control over what or how much is eaten. And again, I want to emphasize here that really the hallmark of a binge eating episode is that second uh, bullet point that you see there. It's that sense of loss of control. The sense of not being able to stop once you started, the sense of not being able to stop eating even if you got interrupted by something, that really is the hallmark criterion of a binge eating episode. Um, despite the fact that I think in terms of pop culture, a lot of people really think about the amount of food as the more hallmark of that uh, particular diagnosis. So when we think about binge eating episode features or maybe characteristics that often go along with these types of eating episodes, individuals typically endorse a number of these different features that you can see here on this slide. So often we're hearing from people that they're eating more rapidly than they typically do. They eat to the point that they're really uncomfortable. And then so often after a binge, you're hearing people talk about feeling disgusted with themselves. They're really ashamed. They feel guilty about what they ate or how much they ate. So again, as I mentioned, there are a number of eating disorder diagnoses that really hinge on binge eating episodes. And the first uh, that we're going to talk about is bulimia nervosa. The hallmark or the defining feature of bulimia nervosa is a combination of those binge eating episodes that we just described, in addition to regularly engaging in what we call inappropriate compensatory behaviors. It's sort of a mouthful, but really what we're talking about there are things like self-induced vomiting, laxative abuse, compulsive or driven exercise, fasting, enemas, any of these kinds of behaviors that um, are designed to kind of compensate for food eaten. 
Um, and there, with, um, with the DSM-5 iterations, there are no particular subtypes, but there are severity ratings in that individuals who are engaging in maybe one to three of those types of inappropriate compensatory behaviors have a mild a severity rating, and those that are engaging in 14 or more of those might be designated as extreme. Again, there are certainly limitations when it comes to this type of nosology or structure for diagnosis, but this is a sort of general guideline that exists as of now. Binge eating disorder is another diagnosis that really hinges on that type of binge eating um, episode. And this is a diagnosis in which individuals are engaging in these regular binge eating episodes, but they're not using those inappropriate compensatory behaviors, at least not on a quote unquote regular basis. So here the severity ratings are based on how many binge eating episodes there are per week, Every, everywhere from one to three, which is mild, to 14 or more per week, so really at least two a day almost um, in that extreme range. Another very common eating disorder diagnosis, especially um, here more recently, both in adult and pediatric clinics, is avoidant restrictive feeding intake disorder, or ARFID. The defining feature here is eating or feeding disturbance that really is kind of evident by a persistent failure to meet nutritional needs. Now, for those of you that heard me talk through anorexia nervosa, you might be thinking, that sounds awfully similar to that diagnosis. But really what we're talking about with ARFID is less about this fear of weight gain or fear of fat, and it's more perhaps a thing like not being interested in food or having difficulties with the sensory characteristics of food. So it's less sort of weight driven or appearance driven and more about failing to meet those nutritional needs for other reasons. And then our kind of catch-all category, the um, kind of NOS category that the DSM is fond of, the other specified feeding or eating disorder. And these are going to be diagnoses like atypical anorexia nervosa, wherein individuals are meeting all of the diagnostic criteria except for perhaps weight. These might be individuals that live in larger bodies that have lost a significant amount of weight, but they're not meeting that kind of fairly stringent BMI criterion, for example. Um, this might also include individuals who um, manifest many characteristics of bulimia nervosa or binge eating disorder, but you know maybe not every single day or maybe not for the required three months, things along those lines. Purging disorder and night eating syndrome are also two distinct kinds of presentations of other specified feeding or eating disorder. Um, purging disorder is one in which individuals are engaging in self-induced vomiting or other kinds of purging methods in the absence of binge eating episodes. And night eating syndrome um, has a variety of understandings given that the diagnostic criteria keep moving, but essentially these are individuals that are eating the majority of their caloric intake, 75% or more in the later part of the day while having a morning lack of appetite, for example. So um, now that we've talked a little bit about the diagnoses, I want to turn it over to Dr. Perry, who's going to walk us through the common symptoms and medical complications of these various diagnoses. Thank you, Christine. I want to start by saying that the most important thing to remember is that eating disorders are multi-system diseases. And, and that's the message that we want you to leave with today, if nothing else. Um, many patients will present first with some constitutional symptoms as you um, can see here in terms of fatigue or malaise. It's often surprising to me that they have fatigue and malaise, but they may actually be doing quite a bit. Um, they may be overachievers in school and taking on a lot given the level of energy and how they overall feel. The other thing that we see quite a bit is temperature dysregulation, and this is a great sign to be able to use in the primary care office because patients with a low body temperature and bradycardia are not bradycardic because they're athletes. They're bradycardic because they have an eating disorder. So temperature dysregulation is a really good indicator. And, and this occurs because of alterations in your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system and um, is beyond the scope of this lecture, but important to remember that many patients experience temperature dysregulation being excessively sensitive to both cold um, and hot weather, as well as oftentimes, especially in your anorexics, having low body temperature. Uh, we also see a number of cardiovascular uh, complications commonly, orthostasis and dizziness and bradycardia being the most common. Um, patients sometimes will present the first time because they've had a syncopal episode, um, and they may have had that eating disorder for quite some time, and it's gone undetected. 
In terms of measuring orthostasis, we'll talk a little bit more in future slides um, but and talk about how we define orthostasis. Um, patients may actually not even realize they're having these symptoms because they become accustomed to feeling this way, and it's important to really ask very concrete questions, especially with your adolescents, um, to make sure that you um, get these details from them. Um, and again, metabolic and electrolyte abnormalities um, can happen in a variety of circumstances, either in patients who are very undernourished and are purging, um, or in our patients who have bulimia or binge eating disorder. Um, hypokalemia can occur in the setting of refeeding syndrome, where someone's been starved for an extensive period of time and then begins to intake food and has a rapid increase in their insulin um, and a shift uh, from extracellular to intracellular uh, potassium, resulting in hypokalemia. Um, hyponatremia can occur when patients are water loading or drinking excessive amounts of water to feel full. Um, we've seen patients present, actually, unfortunately, with seizures um, after uh, extensive water loading. You can also see a hypochloremic alkalosis in the setting of chronic purging or um, in laxative abuse. Ketonuria you'll see for patients who are hypovolemic, um, who are um, not getting enough to drink, or um, also for patients who are breaking down muscle, um, and hence we're seeing um, both protein and ketone in, in their urine. From an endocrine standpoint, oftentimes you'll see menstrual irregularities, either amenorrhea where there's absence of amenses for at least three months, or oligomenorrhea where their menses are kind of coming on and off. That's especially common in patients with bulimia um, and with binge eating disorder. And again, sometimes gets missed as an assumption that it might be related to um, their weight or it might be related to other factors. So important when patients present with menstrual irregularities to look at some of their eating behaviors. Um, we see in the long term, patients, um, particularly those in starvation state, will go into a hypogonadal state. So that means that they have hypothalamic suppression and lower secretion of their pituitary hormones and hence don't have periods um, and have very low estrogen and in males very low testosterone. Unfortunately, because of the, the low estrogen state that many of our patients are in and some vitamin deficiencies, they may develop osteoporosis or osteopenia. We see an increased risk of fractures, particularly stress fractures, in adolescents with active disease, and we do see a higher risk in the long term for fractures in uh, women who report a history of eating disorders. Gastrointestinal complaints are quite common. We can see constipation in patients who are under eating, um, as well as in patients who are chronically abusing laxatives. Reflux is a common concern, either in patients who are constipated because they're not eating much, um, or in patients, again, who are purging through vomiting. Irritable bowel syndrome, or the symptoms of so, um, intermittent flatulence alternating between diarrhea and constipation, um, abdominal bloating and discomfort, all very common complaints of patients, and sometimes cause uh, resistance to restoration of weight um, or to refeeding because it's uncomfortable to eat, especially when first getting back on a nutrition plan. And, and that's probably partly a result of gastroparesis, which will occur in an undernourished state or in a situation where individuals are purging substantially. The hematologic abnormalities that we see include anemia and leukopenia, very rarely thrombocytopenia, so we didn't list that as it's not as common. And this occurs because of an individual being in a malnourished state. So I kept mentioning malnourished state. We do see some vitamin deficiency. Most commonly we'll see a low vitamin D and low ferritin, um, but not uncommon also a folate or B12 deficiency. And other deficiencies exist that we can't test for or detect or that may not be evident on laboratory studies. In terms of cognitive symptoms, um, we know if we do a CAT scan on patients with um, Anorexia, for example, that we do see um, some cerebral shrinking, which thankfully is reversible with refeeding. But by cognitive symptoms, um, we mean that the individual has difficulty concentrating or they have um, their slightly slow processing. They can present similar to an individual with depression. However, um, sometimes it's solely from the malnourished state. And then certainly there's psychiatric comorbidities, such as anxiety and depression. Sometimes we'll see those preceding the illness um, and being something that may have made them predisposed to an eating disorder, or sometimes we see them 
having developed as a result of the eating disorder. That can be difficult to tease out at times, and we can talk a little bit more about that in this presentation or hopefully future ones with all of you. So then we wanted to also touch on the barriers that there might be in, in trying to detect someone with eating disorders. And this is going to be true sort of no matter what scope of practice or where you might be practicing. But first and foremost, I think that there are some real barriers when it comes to stereotypes about eating disorders. Um, you know, despite the fact that we have a lot of epidemiological studies, population-based studies that indicate that eating disorders do not discriminate, the stereotypes are still around. So if you're thinking about being a clinician in a clinic, the image of someone with an eating disorder might be someone who is young, uh, female in presentation, relatively thin or maybe underweight, and usually Caucasian. Uh, the problem with that is that if that's your stereotype or that's your schema for diagnosis, you're going to miss a wide swath of people with all kinds of eating pathology. So again, the stereotypes um, serve as a real barrier to detection. We also know that there tends to be a real under-recognition of bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. I think if you ask the average clinician or even the average person on the street to talk about an eating disorder, typically what's going to come to mind is anorexia nervosa. Uh, there's more pop culture representation uh, of, of depictions of anorexia nervosa. I think within medical and psychiatric communities, there's certainly more. Or, um, acute concern about anorexia nervosa, just given some of the low weight status concerns that exist. So because of that, those things tend to converge such that we're often missing bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder, particularly because they can occur in individuals that don't have any quote unquote apparent weight problems, for example. Um, we also know that another major barrier to detection is the reluctance to disclose symptoms. You know, for those of you who are in a primary care setting, you may be very used to having patients come to you and saying, you know, listen, I have a fever, I have a rash, or I'm not feeling good in this particular way. Patients with eating disorders are often very reluctant to even disclose that they have any concerns about their eating or their weight. So um, one of the things that might be useful there is using self-report screeners, where sometimes it feels a little bit safer to disclose those sorts of things on a piece of paper or on a tablet than to the clinician in the room. And for those of you who didn't have a chance to see session one, session one spent a lot of time talking about those different screeners. So we encourage you all to take a look at that if you're curious to learn more about the screeners. Other barriers to detection include that uh, we're a very weight-focused society right now, and there's a lot of emphasis on the obesity epidemic and wanting our and wishing for our patients to uh, lose weight. It's even a quality metric in a lot of institutions to see a change in BMI or to counsel patients on BMI. So when a patient presents with a BMI that was previously in the 75th percentile or 85th percentile, and now they're in the 50th percentile, unfortunately, oftentimes they'll get applauded for that because that's oftentimes where the emphasis is um, in the healthcare setting. Um, unfortunately, we need to know how they got there um, and um, how quickly they got there. So using our growth chart data becomes really important in terms of looking at the rapidity of the trend downward um, as well as the, how dramatic that change is. The other thing that comes up frequently is patients have uh, stopped having their period and they participate in a sport. Um, it, it really is uncommon for individuals to become amenorrheic solely from participating in a sport. What that means is that they are participating in a sport that requires more energy demand and more of certain types of food sources, um, including carbohydrates and fats, um, and they're not getting enough of it. Some of that might be intentional, some of that might, might be unintentional, but it still implies that they're not getting the intake that they need or the balance of nutrients that they need to be able to have a period, um, and, and hence we don't want to attribute it to the sport and move on. We want to explore more what they're eating and think about uh, ways that they can increase intake to help with increasing their overall estradiol production and have a functioning menstrual cycle. Um, and I highlighted this already, but those assumptions about individuals in the healthy BMI range is important, too. So again, they may maintain a, a BMI um, in a certain range, but we need to understand better um, what the behaviors are in terms of what, how they maintain that BMI. So what I always emphasize is less about the number and more about the trend as well as the thoughts and behaviors that are behind that number. And when we better understand that with our patients, we'll be able to determine which ones have an eating disorder or, at, or, or are at risk for an eating disorder. 
in terms of the medical assessment, your vitals become a really vital way <laughs> to um, better understand whether you have a patient with an eating disorder or who is having medical complications associated with the eating disorder. Um, the resting heart rate becomes really important. And if any of you work in a busy pediatric office or a busy family medicine office, you're going to have a patient who's in the waiting room. They get up and follow the MA to a room. They sit down, um, have their vitals checked, and then they go to an exam room. Um, at least that's what happens in my office and in many offices. And unfortunately, that's not going to give us a resting heart rate. So you may see a heart rate that is um, more elevated than um, is uh, accurate for that patient. So they really need to be resting uh, for five minutes, lying down, to get an accurate resting heart rate. Um, the other um, thing is making sure that we're looking at blood pressure, again, after they've been resting for a period of time, um, as opposed to immediately after getting up and walking to um, an intake room. And finally, the temperature, um, as I mentioned, is really important, um, and um, hypothermia is an important indicator in terms of an eating disorder. Again, thinking about especially your athlete, if they're bradycardic and they're hypothermic, it's not because they're an athlete. It's because they're not getting what they need. Um, so a temperature of less than 35.6 or less than 96 would be considered hypothermic and even a potential indication for admitting to the hospital. In terms of how we check the um, orthostatics, there's a variety of different methods out there. Um, what's often used in the medical literature related to eating disorders is um, lying for five minutes to check blood pressure and pulse and then standing for two minutes to check blood pressure and pulse. And we look for that change um, in systolic and diastolic blood pressure as well as change in heart rate. Um, it's also important to think about in patients who have eating disorders or suspected eating disorders how you weigh them uh, when they come into the office. Many um, don't know their weight, don't want to know their weight, or may be harmed from knowing their weight. Um, so our, in our office, in those situations, those patients will be asked to empty their bladder first to ensure that there's not, um, they're not holding in urine to uh, falsely elevate their weight. Um, we'll also use that as an opportunity to do a point of care urine where we can look at their specific gravity, again, to understand whether they have been uh, water loading and as well as to look for protein or ketones in their urine to get a sense of their overall um, starvation state and hydration status. Um, so we'll have them empty their urine, their bladder, excuse me, as I mentioned, and then um, have a weight with a gown only on facing away from the scale so that they can't see their weight. Um, and that's the other important part is being consistent about how you weigh patients as well as doing it in a gown only so that there, there's not pockets that are filled with things or other ways to um, falsely elevate the weight. And then the heart rate walk test is a um, test that's actually used more in adult medicine, um, but that's where individuals walk for six minutes and can be used more instructionally with patients to demonstrate the conditioned athletic heart versus the malnourished heart. So a conditioned athletic heart, when you walk for six minutes at a rapid pace, is going to maintain a relatively similar heart rate. But a malnourished heart, even though it might present looking similarly in terms of the heart rate and description of activity, will fluctuate quite a bit in um, heart rate throughout that six minutes. So that's a test that you can Google and find out more about in terms of how to do it. Um, but it can be used um, not necessarily as a prognostic indicator, but as an instructional tool with patients who are often convinced that they have a low heart rate and a low body mass and that they are in a healthy state um, by being um, that way. In terms of medical assessment, um, a lot of what we talked about you're, you'll want to you'll see on physical exam. There's other characteristic findings that are important. So lanugo is one, the, the hypothermia um, results in regrowth of that lanugo that we had as infants to um, help preserve our body temperature. It comes back in individuals with uh, starva in starvation state or individuals in an undernourished state. Um, also, because of vitamin deficiencies, we'll see hair loss, we'll see dry skin, we'll see bruising. In terms of individuals that are purging through vomiting, we'll see swollen parotid glands. You might see dry mucous membranes, or you might see multiple oral ulcers um, due to um, recurrent uh, vomiting and irritation of the mucosa. And certainly, you want to look at dentition and inspect that um, in more detail. Sometimes, I will also ask for uh, information from their dentist who can tell uh, in a little bit more detail what's been happening in terms of damage from chronic purging. 
Um, cardiovascular exam becomes very important, particularly looking at extremities to evaluate for edema and acrocyanosis. Um, again, I'll use this as an instructional tool as well with patients to say that look, looks like your circulation is really um, central right now and not peripheral because your body isn't getting enough energy to be able to maintain circulation everywhere. Respiratory rate and effort is important. Uh, rare but important complications with eating disorders include uh, pneumothorax or pneumomediastinum. Um, this is thought to be secondary to malnutrition or also could be due to um, uh, extremely forced vomiting. From an abdominal perspective, you might see slowed bowel sounds or hyperactive bowel sounds as well as distension or tenderness um, and certainly a palpable stool mass in those individuals that have been chronically um, constipated. From a neurologic perspective, um, we may see weakness or decreased sensation um, or ataxia uh, depending on their level of nutritional deficiency as well as if there's a presence of any uh, electrolyte abnormalities. One of the things that often comes up is how to manage adults versus children or adolescents. It's a little bit easier to approach the issue sometimes with children or adolescents because their parents ultimately are in charge. But when we're managing adults, that can become more challenging. Um, certainly, um, even pediatrics offices will have patients who are 18 years and up. And that becomes um, challenging from the perspective of when are they, how do we engage them in treatment, um, and when do we need to think about whether um, others need to be pulled in to be involved in their care. Um, in terms of children and adolescents, it's always really important to involve patients, um, involve their families in their care. Um, for adults, that may become more difficult, but I encourage um, our adult patients to include their families, their partners, whoever is in their life to be involved in part of their care. Um, and certainly in rare circumstances, if they're in imminent danger, then depending on your laws and your state, sometimes the patients will be invol involuntarily admitted or committed um, depending on the level of harm that we're observing. When approaching patients and families to talk about an eating disorder, especially if it's thinking about that eating disorder from the first time, uh, for the first time or to bring it up for the first time, it's important to ask them what they think is going on, what they think about their change in weight or ch weight trend, if they have concerns about that, looking at the different physical findings, as I mentioned, the lanugo or the swollen parotids or um, the significant um, uh, uh, constipation um, or certainly your vital sign findings. It's really important to emphasize that you're concerned about all these findings and collectively what it means um, and, and, and advise them about all of their physical and mental health needs. I like putting it all together in that inter interdisciplinary discussion. So it's not, I think you have an eating disorder and you need to go see a therapist, but you have an eating disorder or you may have an eating disorder or you may be undernourished. And at this point, we need to involve multiple members in the team to help us figure this out as well as to better understand how we can get you healthier. And that's going to include a psychologist or therapist. That's going to include a nutritionist. That's going to include a, a me as your primary care doctor or potentially other specialists. Another important thing that individuals with eating disorders or who haven't been exposed to eating disorders in the past don't understand are the long-term health outcomes. So we know individuals um, have a significantly lower life expectancy when they um, have untreated eating disorders, as many as 25 years um, off of their expected, um, of their life expectancy. That's very significant and oftentimes, particularly for families, really helps them think about the severity of the disease. Um, the other thing that I'll emphasize are things when we find new thyroid 6 syndrome, for example, where their thyroid is slowed um, to um, help with uh, slowing their metabolic rate. Well, that is, an, is something that we also see in the neonate intensive care unit in our neo, neonates or in the intensive care unit with our very, very sick um, either uh, adolescent or adult patients. So it, again, um, brings to light how severe the disease is, as well as highlighting all the different systems from a laboratory perspective as well as on your physical exam that you're seeing. In individuals with low estrogen, too, we know there's long-term implications in terms of fertility, in terms of um, bone density, as well as in terms of um, cardiovascular health, given the importance of estrogen being present for a good part of your life um, for longevity purposes. And then finally, the other thing I emphasize is 
you may not be able to get this all done at once. You've discovered that they may have an eating disorder. You've noticed things on physical exam that are consistent. They're not completely bought into it. They're not ready for referrals or treatment. If they're not in imminent danger and you feel that they're safe to walk out the door, it's okay to do an assessment over time to help sort out what's going to work best for them and to help pull the team together that they're going to need. So I always try to lead with that given that there's a, a, a it's very hard in a busy pediatric office or family medicine office to get all of these things done. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly reorient us. We spent the last little bit here talking about the different types of eating disorders and how they might be assessed, some barriers to those assessments. Um, but also now we want to talk about the level of care guidelines. So if you do have individuals in your practice who you suspect have an eating disorder or who have had a formal diagnosis, how do we determine what level or type of care that they might need to get them back to a healthy status? And for those of you who may not be totally familiar with the varying levels of care, particularly for eating disorders, I wanted to lay those out very broadly. And, and the types of programming that goes into each of these is going to vary depending on where they're being treated. But broadly speaking, the levels of care from most intense to least intense are inpatient, residential, partial hospitalization, or what some call day treatment intensive outpatient, and then outpatient. We're going to talk a little bit about these different types of care and, and what they might mean and the decision-making process that goes into them. But, you know, it, essentially, I'm not going to read every single piece that's on, the, on this slide, but it's good to just be aware when we talk about the different levels that there can be different levels um, depending on the severity of the eating disorder, depending on, um, you know, sort of the medical stability of the individual. There's a lot of decision making that goes into that. Um, and we're going to talk more specifically about both the psychiatric or psychological variables that come into play in addition to the medical pieces that help us understand how to place someone in the right level of care. So um, I know that this might be a little bit hard to see, but you'll have access to this through our website, and, and I'll show you where that's linked here in a moment. But um, these are the guidelines that were set out from the um, APA uh, but now back in 2006. So these are pretty outdated at this point. However, the updated level of care guidelines are forthcoming probably in the next year or so or within the next year. Um, the nice thing is, is that um, despite the fact that this was published in 2006, they still have a lot of relevance for today. So I'm going to walk you through what we're looking at here on this slide. On the far left-hand column, you can see various domains. These are the different domains that we're looking at to help us determine what type of care or what level of care is needed. On the very top row going across, you can see the different levels of care, just like I described. Outpatient is the least intense, intensive outpatient, partial, residential, and inpatient. So these are going in ascending order, whereas I had them in descending order before. And what you'll see is, for example, with uh, medical status, if the individual is determined by, you know, a physician or someone on the medical team that that individual is medically stable enough that they don't need more extensive monitoring as it's defined in levels four and five, then they are suitable for outpatient, they're suitable for intensive outpatient, they might be suitable for partial hospitalization. It's not until you get into some of these other markers, for example, on the far right-hand corner, things like, you know, the uh, bradycardia that Dr. Perry had been describing or some of the other vital signs findings um, that may be more indicated for an inpatient level of hospitalization. Um, the other domains that are there are things like suicidality, the percentage of weight that someone is, and again, we can have a discussion about the limitations that exist there with that, but that far left-hand column really talks about the different domains that we're assessing to determine what type or what level of care an individual might need. The other domains are going to be things like the motivation to recover, insight, or the ability to control obsessive thoughts. This, largely speaking, has a lot to do with someone's psychology. So, um, you know, an outpatient level of care really does require a fair amount of motivation because, for example, if you're seeing your outpatient providers maybe once a week on those occasions, it means that the individual, the patient, really has to be motivated to engage in their homework assignments, to really do a lot of the more challenging work without being supervised with a team. Unlike, for example, somebody who's on an inpatient unit, that person is going to be monitor monitored 24-7. That's not to say that those individuals 
individuals don't need to have good motivation. They certainly do, and it can help expedite treatment. But the idea is that there's more supports available to individuals at higher levels of care um, that help kind of shore up some of that motivation, whereas on outpatient, you're really going to kind of need to have that in your back pocket. The other domains are things like uh, comorbid disorders, which we know are very common, particularly things like substance use disorders, PTSD, depression, anxiety. If some of those comorbid disorders are um, impeding care for an eating disorder, it's really important to take that into consideration. Fortunately, there are some eating disorders programs that actually offer um, tracks or um, programs specifically for co-occurring disorders. So for example, they might have an anorexia nervosa and PTSD track or an anorexia nervosa an OCD track where both of those diagnoses can really be expertly addressed. Other domains include things like how much structure does an individual need to restore weight? Um, what's the ability for that individual to control compulsive exercising? This is something, and the last one also is about purging behaviors. These inappropriate compensatory behaviors can oftentimes move someone from a lower level of care up to a higher level of care, just given their frequency or their intensity. I'll give the example of compulsive exercise. It is notoriously difficult to address compulsive or driven exercise on an outpatient basis. You know, we don't go home with our patients. We don't monitor them. We don't watch every move that they make. So they can be engaging in these kinds of behaviors really regularly without um, a specialty team even being aware. So that might necessitate then that someone actually does go up to a higher level of care where they have more regular monitoring, where they might even be on you know, a, a residential unit or an inpatient unit where they're monitored 24-7 to really help them cease those behaviors. Um, that symptom interruption for things like compulsive exercising and other purging behaviors is really crucial and is challenging to do at a lower level of care. Other domains to be considering for levels of care are things like environmental stressors, um, so things like being able to provide practical support and structure. You know, for, for families, for example, that are needing to do family-based therapy, which is typically indicated for children and adolescents, if you have parents who are not often available or parents who are in the middle of a divorce, that type of intervention may not actually be indicated. Also, this is something that we run into here in North Carolina quite a bit, geographic availability of a treatment program. That's a real concern, and it's part of why this is part of our decision making. You know, we may have folks that are very interested and quite amenable to doing an outpatient level of care, but if they're going to have to come in from four hours away in the mountains, it's really infeasible for them to come here and do regular treatment. So they might be better served with something like a partial hospitalization closer to where they are to kind of give them a bolus of treatment for lack of a better term. So for those of you who are interested in learning more about these treatment guidelines, you can visit our website. We have a whole uh, resource library available to help guide your decision making if you're working with adults or children or adolescents that have eating disorders. So please visit our website to learn more. And if you're looking for specific referrals in your area, we would encourage you to use the website findedhelp.com. This is a free search engine that can help narrow treatment down based on your geographic location, the patient's insurance, what type of treatment do they need, you know, are, they, are you looking for a dietitian? are you looking for a psychologist or a therapist of some kind. Um, this is a great resource. And again, I'll give another plug for those of you who weren't able to attend the first session. I'd encourage you to take a look at um, the first webinar that we gave because we talked in depth about both screening and referral practices. In terms of just a broad overview of treatment interventions, because this really could be its own presentation, um, you know, we could spend lots of time talking about treatment interventions, but if you're thinking about these different levels of care, be it outpatient treatment, residential, inpatient, largely a lot of the treatment interventions are going to look similar. So first and foremost, cognitive behavioral therapy, which many of you who are here from mental health disciplines are very familiar with. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a very common intervention for those with eating disorders um, across different levels of care. So here you're identifying those patterns, the negative thoughts, and really the functions that underlie that eating disorder behavior and how we can intervene. Um, family-based therapy, or at least a family-based model, is something that is also very common across different treatment settings, whether it's outpatient or inpatient. Uh, and this really just helps to highlight the importance of including the family unit, particularly when it comes to refeeding or when it comes to um, weight restoration, some of those more challenging pieces. 
And then also, it's very common for individuals to be receiving some kind of pharmacotherapy. One thing I do want to note, however, is that pharmacotherapy typically for eating disorders treats comorbid conditions, things like anxiety, depression, maybe under other underlying psychopathology. Uh, there's not necessarily, for example, a medication for anorexia nervosa. The only um, exception to that is the medication lives amphetamine for binge eating disorder. That is FDA approved on label as a monotherapy for binge eating disorder. Um, I will say though that you know it can be, um, there are some challenges in, in sometimes identifying providers that will be willing to prescribe some of those medications. Um, we can talk about that towards the end if you all have questions about that. But I just wanted to make it clear that there aren't necessarily, with the exception of lived amphetamine, there aren't necessarily medications for bulimia nervosa or a medication for anorexia nervosa. So I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Perry, who's going to talk a little bit more about medical status when you're trying to determine a level of care. What sort of information might you be looking for? What kinds of tests you might be running, et cetera? There are multiple level of care, levels of care, excuse me, but ultimately the medical status can be a limiting factor. Um, and that can be a limiting factor in two ways. One, it can be a limiting factor based on what type or what level of medical complexity a residential facility can accept. So some of this is on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and then it may be that a patient needs continuous monitoring. And in that case, they may need medical uh, hospitalization for stabilization before going to a higher level of care for residential treatment. Um, so this is where the physician, be, it becomes really important to help with making that call in terms of are they medically stable to be in a residential facility where there's less medical monitoring versus do they need to be in a medical facility stabilized and then transferred. Um, and the parameters that are used, um, unfortunately, vary a fair amount regionally and by hospital, but the um, heart rate is one that is particularly emphasized. Certainly, less a heart rate less than 40 is typically a medical uh, admission for uh, monitoring. Certainly, electrolyte abnormalities that require um, replacement are also medically indicated. Uh, typically, if we have patients that have orthostasis, um, orthostatic hypotension, um, who are symptomatic, so having syncopal episodes or are very busy on standing will require some degree of medical stabilization before going to a residential facility. Um, any patients that have other underlying chronic diseases that need stabilization, um, such as patients with diabetes who have out of control blood sugars as part of their eating disorder condition would need medical stabilization before transfer. Um, it sometimes can be overwhelming in hearing about all the different levels of treatment. And so I say to the medical providers out there, it really comes down to are they medically stable enough where they don't need that continuous monitoring for low heart rate or for cardiovascular instability or electrolyte abnormalities. Um, and then it becomes a, a joint treatment, a, a, a joint team decision. So the psychologist or therapist the nutritionist, everyone needs to weigh in in terms of how a patient is able to carry out the various aspects of their care plan. Um, it may be that medically they appear very stable, however, the nutritionist is seeing very little advancement in their meal plan or the psychologist um, sees that they're stuck. Um, so those are circumstances where it becomes critically important for that interdisciplinary team to decide together what the treatment needs are uh, for the patient and what level of care they are. But they will rely heavily on the physician to ensure that a patient is medically stable and safe in terms of um, the various, level of care, various levels of care beyond medical hospitalization. In terms of laboratory assessment, this is going to be part of determining level of care because certainly certain abnormalities um, such as hypokalemia or hypomagnesemia are going to necessitate uh, hospitalization, um, replacement, and monitoring to ensure stabilization. So this is a list of lab labs that we would typically recommend um, in the initial assessment of a patient with an eating disorder in addition to an EKG. Um, the additional analyses I wanted to focus on just a bit, um, if uh, my standard practice to include magnesium, phosphorus, and uh, ferritin and EKG um, with every presentation. In terms of complement, um, testing a complement, that is recommended because there is some evidence that patients with chronic malnutrition will show 
uh, low complement, um, which can impact immune function and can be um, a sign of malnutrition. I haven't typically checked that, but that is something where there is some medical evidence to suggest that that would be one factor that would be identified in evidence of low nutrition. In terms of when to um, do a bone density screen or when to check hormones, that's really on a case-by-case -case basis based on how a patient presents. But any individual who's been amenorrheic for more than six months, you should consider bone densitometry. And you want to make sure that you're doing that in a facility for adolescents or children that uses the appropriate parameters to identify true osteopenia or osteoporosis in those circumstances. And the same goes with serum estradiol or serum testosterone. It really, it really depends on how they present. If they're presenting with signs uh, of a uh, hypogonadal state, then that should be part of your initial evaluation. And as an adolescent medicine provider, I have to say that every patient is pregnant until proven otherwise. So if they're not menstruating, um, regardless of what else is going on, a urine HCG should always be part of that initial evaluation. Other um, non-routine tests um, include toxicology screen um, when you're concerned about substance use. Uh, a serum amylase can be helpful if you're suspicious of vomiting, but again, as we talked about, for many patients there can be a lot of shame or it can be difficult to disclose everything that's going on, and so some of these can be um, used to help better understand the severity of the disease. The serum amylase being elevated um, in and of itself does not indicate vomiting, but it can be fractionated to look at it in terms of just the salivary amylase. Um, and most labs know how to do that if you call them and ask. Um, and um, that can be uh, helpful in determining the reason for the elevated amylase. As I mentioned, you may want to um, be looking at LH, FSH, certainly beta HCG, and prolactin in patients who are amenorrheic. Um, at times, if patients have significant neurologic signs or cognitive deficits, uh, an MRI or CT would be considered. Um, I will tell you that it's not uncommon for patients to present with an eating disorder and something else going on. Um, I've had many patients who developed uh, an eating disorder after um, a long struggle with celiac disease, for example, unaware they have celiac disease and develop an eating disorder, and both need to be treated adequately, and oftentimes one gets um, detected without the other. So important to think about that this could be the presentation of a chronic disease and eating disorder together. Um, that's where, again, a stool glyac might come in if you're suspecting um, any sort of uh, inflammatory bowel disease or certainly if there's any suspicion of GI bleeding from um, chronic or recurrent vomiting. And in patients where you're unclear uh, whether there might be laxative or diuretic abuse, you can check urine or stool um, to look for that if needed. I, I don't typically see that happen in the primary care setting, um, but certainly um, inpatient at times um, I've unfortunately had patients where they've been able to bring in diuretics um, uh, surreptitiously or have parents that bring it for them or different things, so being able to test for that does become important in order to better understand physical findings or laboratory findings that aren't adding up. All right, so now we've had a chance to talk about um, the eating disorder diagnoses and the different level of, levels of care that might go into treating those conditions. So now we want to spend some time talking about best practices for collaborating with an eating disorder specialty team. So how do we all kind of work together in this, in this uh, type of environment? And really, we tend to think about it as a four-legged stool, that the treatment of eating disorders, as, uh, as Martha had mentioned, really isn't just, oh, we think you have an eating disorder, we're going to send you off to a specialty place, that it really needs to have input from everybody involved on the team in order for the patient to reach whole wellness. So this is going to include individuals that have a nutrition background, individuals from mental health, whether they're therapists, psychologists, some kind of combination of the above, uh, the primary care physician, as well as psychiatry and or adolescent medicine um, as Dr. Perry's um, uh, background is represented. So I think it's really important that it isn't that one person is calling the shots, but that we're all working together to provide input both to determine a level of care, but also seeing that level of care actually play out. We all need to work together in that regard. This is an amazing part of medicine that I think we don't have enough opportunity to 
participate in because you really get all aspects of a patient's life and you're really able to help them in all aspects and so often we're very siloed but this disease in particular necessitates bringing us together and I think for many other diseases we should be brought together because we'll have much more success overall and long-term well-being but it's, uh, it's really a privilege to be able to work um, as a team and be able to understand all aspects of a patient's overall health and well-being. So in terms of a little bit of the nitty-gritty, um, we're going to talk just kind of broadly about a few different factors that might come up when you are working as an interdisciplinary team. You know, whether or not you guys are all co-located, whether or not, uh, you know, you might be working across several regions of a state, which is also not uncommon. Uh, one of the first things that comes up has to do with care coordination. Because there are so many cooks in the kitchen, it can be really challenging to make sure that you're in communication with them regularly, to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Um, part of why I bring this up is that it's really important that all the providers in that four-legged stool have the same treatment recommendations in terms of level of care, seeing a severity of the eating disorder, or certain behaviors, because it's really challenging, for example, if those of us who are in a specialty treatment center are concerned about the compulsive exercise, the amenorrhea, whatever it might be, and perhaps there are other individuals of the team who aren't so concerned about that, so they're giving patients a different message about what symptoms are concerning, which ones are not. So again, I think coordinating care is just something that's really crucial to make sure that everyone's on the same page. And one thing to note is that uh, that, that uh, care coordination piece is going to really differ by level of care. So if he, the individual or if the patient is on an inpatient unit or a residential facility, that care coordination oftentimes is all taking place in-house because they have physicians who are overseeing medical health, they have pharmacists, they have dietitians, they have psychologists. So they have regular rounds or regular team meetings where that uh, sort of collaboration can happen more naturally. This really gets to be a lot more challenging and you have to be a lot more mindful of it on those low lower levels of care, so things like intensive outpatient or just straight outpatient. Um, you know, all of us have busy clinic schedules, you're in patients, you know, you're in with patients back to back to back. Uh, but finding the time to carve out to have that quick five, ten minute conversation with the you know, adolescent medicine specialist or with the dietitian becomes really crucial when you all are seeing the same patient on a regular basis. This becomes important, too, because sometimes we rely on what our patients are telling us as was recommended by the other care providers involved. And how many of you have had that experience where you've given advice and then you've heard that it was communicated in a different way to another provider? So um, I always say that, you know, assume the best of intentions, um, but also verify um, in terms of when patients are giving you information that maybe doesn't match with what um, your care plan would be before challenging the care provider um, or the patient um, arrange for a time to talk and try to work out what the, the overall assessment is. Um, oftentimes also with, with any um, mental illness, sometimes we get differing um, uh, assessments based on the patient's condition when we see them or they see us differently as a medical provider compared to how they see a psychologist. So we get different information and we're making decisions based on that limited amount of information. So putting that whole big picture together before making big decisions, whether it's returning to sports or whether it's a higher level of care, really needs to involve the, the whole team. And again, recognizing that sometimes when patients tell you that they got a certain, they got advice, they got cleared for sports, for example, and that surprises you, it probably is appropriate that it surprises you and important to get um, uh, in touch with team members to verify that that's the case. Um, and it may be um, that the patient perceives that. Um, or that they want to believe that. Again, I always try to assume the best of intentions with everyone, but also verify that, that that's what we want to happen and that it's not really the eating disorder speaking for them um, or they're hearing, the eating disorder is hearing what, what it wants to hear. Um, and that can make a big difference in terms of um, limiting any, um, for lack of a better word, drama that can occur uh, when trying to manage patients that are um, struggling with a very complex mental health illness. In terms of the role of the PCT, um, it really um, comes down to that initial screening, so um, becoming more and more skilled at identifying patients early, recognizing trends in BMI, recognizing vital signs that don't add up, um, evaluating patients um, more closely related to dietary intake when you see menstrual abnormalities, um, making um, questions about um, 
eating-related thoughts and behaviors a part of routine care. And again, many screeners such as um, Bright Futures and others have that built into them, which makes our job sometimes easier. Um, the level of care determination is important in terms of if you identify medical instability, as we talked about earlier, such as that very low heart rate in the low 40s or under 40, um, symptomatic orthostatic hypotension, electrolyte abnormalities, that really would need medical um, stabilization prior to residential care. But beyond that, then involving all the other team members and emphasizing with the family and the importance of the interdisciplinary team and their role in the decision making, that it's not just up to you, that as a team um, of providers, you're going to make that care, uh, you're going to make those care decisions together. Um, in terms of ongoing management, those regular visits, those regular check-ins, with the appropriate way in and vital signs are important, and consistent messaging is absolutely key. So again, that goes back to um, when you hear something from a patient that doesn't sound quite like the plan that was being followed to verify that. Um, and I sometimes um, try to, if I haven't been able to um, touch base with the uh, team, I'll try to get the patient something in writing that maps out the plan that they have. Um, or I'll have patients tell me who just got discharged from a residential program, oh, they didn't send me with any plan. And I think, huh, that doesn't sound quite right. Let me give them a call and see what your outpatient plan was supposed to be. Um, because sometimes, again, the eating disorder is taking hold and the eating disorder doesn't want treatment, even if the individual does. Um, so making sure, again, that you have that consistent messaging in place in terms of the ultimate goal being recovery and that everyone on the team needs to play a role in um, reaching that goal. Um, and then really expressing medical concerns, um, being able to use your skills to point out areas that you see on physical exam that are signs that they're better or not better. Um, you know, a good example is patients that have done a fair amount of weight restoration, but they're not quite there yet in terms of their um, periods haven't returned or their estradiol level is still low. That's a really important um, discussion to have with the patient is that you might be in weight restoration, but what you're eating might make a difference. So we need you, we need you to engage more with your nutritionist. You're not quite there yet. Um, and um, using your medical knowledge and understanding of the eating disorder and the pathophysiology um, involved with the eating patterns associated can make a big difference in terms of the patient being willing to speak that next level in their care progression. Um, it's, a, it's a big motivator when they know that their primary care physician or the physician that, they've, um, that they go to for all of their medical concerns um, is supporting um, this ultimate progression to recovery. And one quick thing that I'll add is that um, the, the nice thing about having a primary care provider do an initial screening or have this initial discussion with a patient or with a patient and family is that typically there's an existing relationship there. So they're already sort of trusting of this individual. They know the type of care they're getting. They trust the recommendations and the treatment plans that are being put out by that provider. Um, and oftentimes, I think that really opens people's minds up to being um, amenable to eating disorders treatment versus, you know, just presenting to a specialty center like there is here at UNC, which can be really intimidating. So I think we can't underscore enough the importance of that kind of warm handoff that can happen between uh, the different offices. So that does it in terms of the bulk of our presentation, and I just, the references are here, and certainly they're quite small text, but uh, most of these are also available on our website. So what I'm going to do now um, is ask Lillian to pull up the final polling question before we move into the Q&A section from you, and all, from you all here in the audience. So we have one final polling question for everyone that I'd like to just bring up. It's pretty brief, pretty straightforward, um, and then we'll dive into the questions that you all might have for Dr. Perry and myself. We'll give everyone just a minute or two to respond. It shouldn't take too long. We'll give everyone maybe another five or ten seconds to respond, and then we'll move on so that you all can ask your questions. All right, Lillian, if you want to go ahead and close out that poll, that'd be great. And then we will open up uh, the discussion for Q&A.
And essentially what's going to happen is if you have questions for either Dr. Perry or myself, you can enter them into the Q&A box, which you should be able to see on your screen towards the bottom. And we'll do our best to answer as many as we possibly can. So one of the first questions that we see here is, what is the difference between mental health slash psychiatry, the prescription piece? Um, in terms of being able to prescribe medications, you need to be a licensed prescribing provider. So that might be in the form of an MD, either as a psychiatrist or as an adolescent medicine specialist like myself, or even a primary care physician. Many primary care physicians will prescribe um, some medications first line um, before involving psychiatry or myself. Um, we also have prescribing nurse practitioners or physician assistants who are, uh, who are being overseen by uh, an MD. Um, so definitely important to think about um, the, that you're referring, if you suspect that someone needs medication management, that you're referring to someone um, for that and that it's clear to patients. Occasionally I've had referrals come to me for medication management, but the patients thought they were coming to see a therapist. Um, so I think that's a really important distinction. And then from, in terms of mental health, there's many, many different licenses in terms of mental health in, in, when we're talking about counseling. So you can have a PhD who's a psychologist, um, like Christine, or you can have um, a licensed clinical social worker, a licensed practicing counselor, um, multiple, multiple different types of licenses that allow for counseling licensed marriage and family therapists. Um, and so one of the most important things when you're thinking about a mental health referral is that you identify individuals who are trained in techniques that are successful in treating eating disorders, which might be um, CBT, as was mentioned, cognitive behavioral therapy, or FBT, um, as well as DBT. Um, those are lots of um, initials, and we can clarify that as needed. But um, for prescribing purposes, it would need to be an MD or um, an NP or PA who's supervised, or an advanced practice provider who's supervised by an MD. I'm going to go ahead and let Dr. Perry handle this one as well. So the question is, what training do you suggest for outpatient mental health providers on the pathophysiology of eating disorders to help make interdisciplinary care more effective? That's a great question. That is a great question. I think understanding some of the basics around um, how patients present um, and what, what they might describe in terms of symptoms is important. I think you need, there, there's less of a need to understand the pathophysiology behind it as much as what the patients are going to report or complain about or what you might observe physically. Um, in terms of getting that training, I think you can get that through and see through, through us, actually, um, or as well as through um, the International Association of Eating Disorders um, and a variety of other um, um, national and international organizations specifically focus on eating disorder training. Many of those um, uh, have websites with learning modules, webinars that are free and that are accessible um, at various times. Um, so I hope that that answers your question, but I think that um, that's, an that's a really important question and one that I'm glad you're asking. The other thing is it's, it's always okay, or at least I feel it's okay as a provider, for people to ask me um, to better understand what I'm observing um, or what the pathophysiology is behind it. In the same way that I like learning from them from the mental health aspect. And that's, again, one of the reasons why being part of an interdisciplinary team can be so rewarding. So our next question is, could we have another training on how therapists can help treat eating disorders in medical settings when there is no specialty care available? Um, the short answer is yes, absolutely. I think that's an area that NSEED is designed to meet. You know, with our core mission of really providing education and training on the management of eating disorders, I think there are many individuals who, you know, provide mental health services and they don't have access to um, a particular specialty team like there might be here at UNC. So the person who asked that question, if you wouldn't mind shooting us an email through our website, uh, that way we can kind of keep track of this. I'd love to talk a little bit more in depth about maybe what needs you have specifically. That'd be great. Thank you. You. The next question I'm going to let Dr. Perry handle in particular because this is actually an area of specialty for her. The question is about, can you talk about serving transgender people in inpatient or residential settings? 
That is another great question. Um, it can be challenging, um, and what I um, recommend is verifying with residential and inpatient facilities whether they are gender affirming, and not just asking if they're gender affirming, but asking them um, how they ask about pronouns, how they um, manage trans um, care, and um, how they um, provide um, rooming and housing. So um, an individual should be roomed or um, in, the, um, uh, in the gender wing that matches their gender identity. And if you're hearing contrary to that, then it may not be the best setting for them, because we want them to be in a, a gender-affirming environment. Um, and I can certainly, again, um, there's a lot more as a whole separate topic, um, and I'm happy to share more resources and even a specific list of appropriate questions to ask. Um, but um, thank you for asking it. Um, and I don't know if you needed more resources or wanted to make sure that we highlight this because it's a really important topic. Um, individuals who are transgender are at higher risk of having eating disorders because of the um, body satisfaction that um, occurs um, at, as a result of gender dysphoria. And so we, we need to be conscious of that as providers of gender affirming care, as well as conscious of that when we're treating patients with eating disorders, recognizing that patients may present with an eating disorder and the underlying um, etiology may be related to gender dysphoria, and if, we, if we're gender affirming, we may see a, a, a resolution or certainly improvement in some of the disordered eating. Um, so thank you again for asking that, and certainly feel free to email us if there's more information that I can provide for you. So the next question is, for remote or rural areas, are there treatment teams that could assist the primary care provider through telehealth? That's a great question. You know, I think that um, there are some initiatives within the larger field of eating disorders. So for example, the Academy for Eating Disorders, the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals, both of those trade organizations are working to provide those kinds of efforts to help provide some ongoing consultation, help provide some resources for those individuals. Um, I would say that the most successful model that's been available is the Project ECHO model. So for those of you who may or may not be familiar with Project ECHO, it's essentially a hub and spoke type model where the specialists sit in the middle of that uh, kind of uh the, 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 they're in the middle of that hub, they are the hub, and then there's individual spokes that go out to the primary care physician, to you know the community mental health provider, so that that centralized hub is providing that ongoing specialty type consultation. The only one in existence for eating disorders right now is in the state of New York. Um, it is very well funded, it's very well researched, they've done a lot of really great care. Um, so I wish that there were more organizations like that, but they do seem to be forthcoming through some of our more um, formal uh, professional organizations. And if you go to the ECHO website, which yep. is through the University of New Mexico, you can find out what the, all of the existing ECHOs are. You may be able to be a guest um, on any of the ECHOs, as well as you may even be right. able to participate in the one that is New York based. Right. So the next question is, I've heard that Europe is using video game therapy with positive results to target eating disorders. What are your thoughts on this, and have you used such a method yourself? I'll jump in here briefly. Um, so what I'm mostly familiar with is using um, virtual reality-based type of exposures for either body image um, concerns or dissatisfaction, um, also using um, virtual reality type approaches for exposures to um, feared foods, so kind of doing that exposure and response prevention type approach through virtual reality. Um, it's not something that um, I have used here at UNC. Um, I think there are very few labs that actually have access to that type of uh, machinery. Uh, and I would say mostly they have been prescribed to research studies and research labs. They're not commonplace in clinical practice and you know, hospitals or other type settings, at least not yet. Uh, I think that the research is still forthcoming, so if they're starting to be a bulk of evidence in that direction, we might see more of that more commonplace, but as of right now, it's not terribly common. Um, the next question we have is, what does the research say about applying telemental health approaches to eating disorder treatment? Are there key studies under, underway that you're aware of? Uh, another great question. Uh, I think that uh, telehealth is something that is being used actually fairly regularly on the ground in clinics. You know, for example, here at UNC, we have the ability to provide telemental health services for eating disorders. Um, but a lot of this, I think, has still remained a case-by-case -case basis because I think that especially for those with, you know, restrictive eating disorders or those who are medically unstable, 
really hard to assess some of that through telemental health. I know they're doing more of that even through um, primary care clinics these days, uh, but I think as far as it being sort of a, a regimented process, we're still not quite there yet. Um, and in terms of research studies, nothing comes to, the, to my mind uh, sort of off the top of my mind, but I do believe that there have been a couple clinical trials that have included telemental health approaches, whether those are like mobile app-based type services or web-based services. If you went to clinicaltrials.gov, there should be a listing there. Uh, one of the next questions is, what are some examples of the most unhelpful, perhaps even un unintentionally detrimental things that PCPs can say or do with someone with an eating disorder? And I'll turn that over to you. Um, so um, I, I think that's a, a question that I think, again, we could spend a whole hour on. Um, I'm a, a health at every size um, believer, which um, means that I think the emphasis should be not on the size of a patient, but on their thoughts and behaviors. And so I think the biggest mistake is focusing on the number as opposed to on the trends and on the individual's internal health and well-being and on other um, health-related factors. I also think in um, adolescents and, and children as well, I think um, when you see weight, when patients see weight loss, I think I mentioned this before, I've had patients who've crossed several percentiles in BMI and have had their physicians say to them, well, um, you can just stay where you are now, it looks good. But if they've gotten there in a very disordered way, they're not going to be able to stay there. And so that can be the start of behaviors that, that they do to try to get there. Um, so wanting to better understand asking questions about how they got there first before telling them that's where they should be. Um, as well as recognizing that if a patient was in the 85th percentile their entire life, that may be where they should live. Um, and we're very, and we have this emphasis on these BMI cutoff points that everyone um, above 85 is overweight and above 99 is obese or, you know, all these different definitions that um, can be very detrimental for, for patients um, if they're healthy um, at, at, at the size that they are and they have healthy thoughts and behaviors, then there doesn't need to be a discussion. And unfortunately, um, oftentimes there's an overemphasis on that number without the, the context uh, around it. So I think that's one of the, the most um, detrimental things. Um, I think also um, uh, emphasizing um, that um, providers will um, reinforce um, for example, patients who are um, bradycardic and hyper-exercising will reinforce that and recognize that as a healthy thing as opposed to, again, exploring, are they also hypothermic? How did they get to that point? What kind of exercise are they doing? Is it too much? Um, are their eating habits um, supporting the activity that they do? Um, and that's, again, where I try to emphasize with patients, uh, regardless of what I'm seeing, then, that, that we eat to fuel our body. We don't exercise to burn off the fuel. And so, again, providers starting to think, have that mindset um, and reinforce that with patients becomes very important. And I think one of the things that I'll weigh in on here for this is maybe just some of what I've heard from my own patients in terms of their visits with primary care providers or just other folks. So, you know, one thing that we commonly hear, and I know that Dr. Perry touched on this briefly, is that if a patient asks for a blinded weight, I think sometimes the offices can bulk at what that means or how to go about doing that. You know, I heard one particular story from a patient who asked for a blinded weight, and they were able to do that. They, they you know, she stepped on the scale backwards, but then they said the number out loud. So it, it you know, it completely defeats the purpose of doing a blinded weight. Um, you know, we also sometimes will hear, or sometimes patients that end up in our clinic here at UNC will talk about, you know, they, they were on you know, in their growth charts, they were on maybe the 50th percentile, and then they drop down to the 35th, 20th percentile, and no one bats an eye. They maybe just attribute it to a growth spurt, or maybe they attribute it to a phase. So maybe not necessarily something that someone is saying or doing, but perhaps not raising the alarm bells when there are things that are pretty marked in a patient's chart. Um, like Dr. Perry said, we could talk all day about this sort of thing, but um, in, the, in the interest of time, we'll go on to the next question. Um, how does orthorexia fit into the eating disorder spectrum, and can this potentially lead to another eating disorder? Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a great question, particularly because orthorexia is something that we see a lot in the traditional media. We see it a lot on social media. Um, for those that are sort of I guess, diagnostic diehards. Um, orthorexia is not a uh, recognized DSM-5 or ICD-10 eating disorder diagnosis. However, orthorexia, and for those who are unfamiliar, it's this sort of preoccupation, this rigid preoccupation on healthy foods, the purity of the foods, not just 
just sort of wanting to eat organic, but sort of this almost um, uh, hyper focus on the healthful or non-healthful qualities of the food such that individuals can actually lose a significant amount of weight um, and it can trigger other eating disorder diagnoses. So um, what I would say is that uh, in answer to the broader question, we would consider this kind of like an OSFED presentation, the other specified feeding and eating disorder, but it can certainly parallel or trigger something like anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa. It's not uncommon for somebody to kind of start with this, oh, I'd like to eat healthy, I'm going to cut out things that aren't organic, and then slowly I cut out this, then I cut out that, until the range of food that's eaten is very limited, that leads to a malnourished state, it leads, it leads to weight loss, um, and then potentially even things like binge eating episodes because you're so underfed. So I think that they can sort of go together hand in glove. The other thing I would say in, in comment to that is that I often will see where there's signs of orthorexia in the families of patients that I'm taking care of with eating disorders. Um, so um, the, they may not have the clinical diagnosis of an eating disorder, but there is um, a very heavy emphasis or overemphasis um, at home um, on the types of foods. Um, that are being um, eaten or not eaten, um, and that can be um, precipitous um, in terms of uh, the, in the other individuals in the home. Um, I, I always liken it to some people can, I, I, I discourage dieting of all kinds, but some people can go on a diet and then resume normal life. Others go on a diet and it precipitates an eating disorder. Um, similar to some people can drink alcohol and not become an alcoholic, but some drink alcohol and, and develop a substance use disorder. And I really try to emphasize that um, with families where you see this context because you have dieters who are able to um, remain either subclinical or not have a clinical eating disorder, but one individual in the family cannot. And sometimes families have trouble understanding that. So with that, we are actually going to turn it back over to Dr. Neary, who's just going to wrap a few things up for us. We thank you so much for all your great questions. This has been really great to interact with you all. Thank both of you, Dr. Pete and Dr. Perry, for taking time today. I think uh, uh, of all the different things that, that I, I've done in, in clinical medicine, I think understanding the relationships you have with patients and providers is really important and understanding when something is not quite right, I, I think becomes more and more critical the further I practice in medicine. So I, I again wanted to thank you for your time and, and efforts from the past webinar and this webinar in presenting. If you missed any of the, uh, the course, we are recording it. If you missed the original course, there's a link up on there to register for the CDC train. And again, the course registration code in for the continuing education credits is all capital CDC PMRS. With that, I'll let you go. Have a good rest of your afternoon, and we look forward to talking to you again in the future.